So next we'll look at a couple of mechanisms that provide some uh, better security guarantees. We'll start with OAuth. This is a fairly common uh, system used in web services for single sign-on. Uh, this is what it looks like when I go to log into a discourse forum and I'm presented with a bunch of options of ways that I can sign up or log into this forum. Uh, if I click the login button, I have all of these options and I'll use my GitHub account to log into it. Now the screen that you see immediately after saying you want to log in using GitHub is it actually redirects you now to the GitHub URL and it gives you a prompt to allow this relying party, the discourse forum, to access some of the information in my account. It basically is saying it's only going to access my email address, no other data, and I'm not giving it privileges to delete all of my GitHub repositories, for example. So I would authorize this to log in. Now what's happening behind the scenes using a protocol called OAuth at a very high level is the following. We have GitHub as the issuer, Discourse the forum is the relying party. What I do is go to Discourse and request this login session. Um, Discourse contacts GitHub and indicates that uh, I've asked to allow Discourse to see my email address. And then when I go interact with GitHub following that redirect, GitHub prompts me to approve whether or not I should share the email with Discourse, and if so, then GitHub goes and returns to them this attestation which says this is my GitHub user ID and this is the email address associated with that account. Now let's talk about an alternative that solves one of the problems that's uh, remaining here. So first of all, this is better than the Twitter version because at least this interaction between the discourse forum and GitHub is just between those two. It isn't broadcasting my email address on some public channel. <clears throat> However, a problem is that GitHub is still in the middle of this interaction. I have to rely on GitHub to be available, and it shows to GitHub that I'm going to try to interact with this forum. So let's look at an alternative that's based on digital signatures. And we're not going to switch examples. Now this is in the context of using the fact that I'm enrolled in the DeFi course in order to access some discounts on some website. Well, a DeFi course would definitely want to make use of technology like digital signatures. So what they might do is issue me a signed enrollment certificate that says that I'm enrolled at a certain time. And it would come with a digital signature that can only be made from the DeFi University administrators. Once I have this signed document, this credential, I can pass that credential on to the website relying party they're able to check it and effectively get the attestation that says, you know, this could only come from the DeFi University administrators and it shows when I'm enrolled in the course. This is a lot better now because even though the attestation is from the university to this relying party, I don't have to show the DeFi University that this is the site that I'm visiting and trying to log into. Now, next we're going to look at a variation of this that provides a privacy benefit. So this attestation reveals more information than I need for the student discount. In particular, this is revealing my email address when all I care about for the student discount is showing my date of enrollment. I might want to keep my email address secret from this website. So one way that we could do this is by instead of issuing uh, a single document with a single signature that contains all of the records that the issuer is willing to attest to about me, I could instead break them up into individually signed chunks. I have one for my email, another for my birth date, another for uh, the dates that I'm enrolled in this course. Now when I go and present my signed credential, I can basically break off the pieces of it and omit them, the ones that I don't want to reveal. I only need to show the signed chunks to the relying party that I care about, so I could show my enrollment attestation to the student discount website, and I could reveal my uh, birth date to the age discount website. And in this example, in both cases, I'm showing them my email address, and what prevents users from mixing and matching these credentials is that there's a signature on each one and there's some common identifier, the account name in this case, uh, that connects them all to each other so that you're only presenting a subset of a single signed document to the relying parties. 
So this is an improvement, but there's still two remaining privacy problems. So the first one is that if I disclose my age in this case uh, to qualify for an age-based discount, I'm revealing my entire birth date by doing so. And really all I wanted needed to do for this uh, purpose is to show that my age is in a certain range. I don't need to reveal my exact birth date. The other problem is that because I am revealing my account identifier, this means that if I go visit this website again at some later stage, I want to collect a different discount a month from now, well, this age discount service would be able to correlate the two uses of it. It would be able to tell that I'm using the same credential with the same identifier each time. And that's revealing more information than I need. All I should be revealing is that I'm, I'm someone who... Uh, has a birth date of this age or is enrolled at this time and no more information than that. So to achieve this we're going to use a technology called anonymous credentials and it's actually going to build on the zero knowledge snarks or zero knowledge proofs that we talked about in the previous lecture. So here the idea is that I have my assigned credential uh, just like before which has all of the pertinent information I might want to use in the credential and it's digitally signed by the issuer DeFi University in this case. And now, instead of presenting the credential directly, I'm going to construct a zero-knowledge proof about this credential that I have. What this means is that I'm going to produce a zero-knowledge proof that makes the following statement. It says, I have a valid document, it is digitally signed by the university, and it shows in this case, the attestations that I'm enrolled during the year in which I'm trying to claim this service. Now, what you should remember, or you could review from the lecture uh, previously that covered zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, zero-knowledge proof, we specify the statement. In this case, it's maybe the session key that I'm trying to, to um, uh, associate it with the session that I'm trying to say uh, qualifies for being, um, I'm enrolled as a student, so this, this session should be able to use the enrolled student um, privileges, resources, whatever those are. Um, and the statement includes what I'm revealing to this, this party, which is that I am enrolled in DeFi U uh, during this year 2022. The witness is all of the secret information that the zero knowledge proof or the ZK snark doesn't reveal and it's marked in red. So basically my signed credential, which includes my email and my account identifier, all of that, and the signature from the DeFi University, those are all kept hidden. They're part of the witness, and in a zero knowledge proof, the zero knowledge means that it's not revealing any more information about the witness. Now there's one more way that uh, I'll discuss improving this kind of scheme, which is to add in the ability for the DeFi University to uh, revoke the credential so that I can't use it anymore. This would make sense if I unenroll myself as a student, I'm no longer a student at DeFiU, then I shouldn't get to access the free DeFi student resources. So the way that we could achieve this is that DeFiU would, in addition to signing these credentials like before and giving them to the user, they also will keep a public list of all of the active documents all of the ones that are currently not revoked, and maybe they would update this every week. Now what you would do is the same kind of proof as before. It would still be a ZK snark, uh, but we would add a little bit more data to it. In particular, the statement now includes the current list published by DeFiU of all of the active documents that aren't revoked. And in the witness, we would be using some additional information that we, the, the subject, have, which is where in that list of non-revoked IDs ours shows up. So the, the list of document IDs is public. We know which document ID is ours. And so this ZK snark is proving that our document is one of the ones that's not currently revoked. But again, the key thing is that it keeps secret which document it is. And in particular, if you go and uh, establish a session with the server, and then at some later date, uh, a, a, you know, a week from now, you go and establish another session. In both cases, you're showing that you have a credential, but you're not revealing even that it's the same one. So your session shouldn't be correlatable. Let's go through one more example before I um, summarize the, the takeaway messages from this. So 
does this string bitcoin.pdf, does that identify a unique document? Well, you probably have in mind with bitcoin.pdf that I'm thinking of the Satoshi white paper. This was the you know Bitcoin founding document from 2009. It's a PDF file. It was published on a mailing list. This is the most famous bitcoin.pdf, so this is probably the one that I mean. Um, but suppose I were concerned about making sure that I'm getting the authentic version of this white paper. Sometimes in Bitcoin development, um, the wording of Satoshi's wisdom in the white paper is used as uh, you know, arguments in support of one developer decision or another. Well, another identifier that might uh, correspond to this document is one with a, a URL that says where I can go to fetch this. There's a bitcoin.pdf hosted at bitcoin.org. There's also one hosted at bitcode.in. And even if, again, bitcoin.pdf is quite famous, you know, I, I have an idea of which document I'm expecting to get. These are two different identifiers, and you might get a different version of the document depending on the choice of whatever operator of uh, those respective websites has decided to put there. Could be that one of them has tampered with the Satoshi white paper document either to add in propaganda or add in their own watermark uh, or what have you. Now you may have seen a name that looks like this from IPFS and what you'll notice here is that there's a hash in between the you know, protocol portion of this URL and the bitcoin.pdf and this is uh, as you might guess a hash of the actual document. What's nice about this is that uh, regardless of which peer in IPFS you go and fetch this document from, by using the name of the document you're fetching as something that includes the hash of that document, you can check when you get this PDF that it is actually, when hashed, matches the hash that's right there in the string identifier for that document. If you go and make a different version of this identifier where you're fetching it from a web gateway, um, you can still do the same thing. Maybe your browser won't, won't by default check the hash when fetching it from an HTTPS service the way that it does if you fetch it directly from IPFS. Um, but regardless, the, the point is that the identifier in this case, because it has the hash of the document right in the identifier, you can always check that the data that you get by retrieving a document that purportedly matches this, you can always check that it matches what you expect right from the name. So let me try to tie this together with some insights. Uh, there's a famous quote in computer science. Um, it's a fun quote because you can get some value out of it early on and come back to it many different times when you're learning about computer science and get something new from it each time. Anyway, the quote is, there's only two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. There's a quote from Phil Carlton. He was an engineer at Netscape. And there's an explanation of this quote that I really like that comes from one of his advisees when he was at Netscape, Simon Hui. And it says, well, the challenge here is that a name is good if it survives even into the future context, even after the name was chosen. The challenge is that later on in the future context, you don't know what other kinds of uh, things are going to coexist in the same space and who you want to disambiguate uh, the thing that you're naming with those. What's happening is that in the DeFi world, we already have a fairly uh, flexible and expressive starting point. So we have a leg up on considering decentralized identifiers in the world of DeFi if you're already familiar with smart contracts at this point in the course. Um, we're used to writing smart contract code where an address is a long public key and that's the main unit of identity that we work with in smart contracts directly. Now, what does this mean? Is it, um, is it a public key? Well, it might be. That's one kind of address. But the address in the smart contract could also be the address of a smart contract. And that smart contract could define some access control policy that's not just a single user owns this key, but rather it's multiple users and you need two out of three, like a multi-sig wallet. And of course, the address could be of a smart contract that does something completely different than just be an access control policy. It could be an auction or some other mechanism. And what's nice about it is that what actually is happening uh, behind this address doesn't really matter to us when writing the smart contract. It's all message.sender. 
Like when we want to use this identifier to describe an access control, all we need to do is say, if I'm writing this function and it needs to be accessed only by Alice, I'll just check that message.sender is this Alice. So my code here looks the same whether this is going to be a public key, Alice has the secret key and has to sign a message to cause this to happen. It also works if um, uh, this address is the address of a smart contract and that smart contract has to have some rules to invoke this function and then that's the case that I would pass this require check because the other other because uh, the other smart contract called this one we get a kind of transparency where it doesn't matter to us what the meaning of this address is our smart contract framework lets us refer to its satisfying its access control policy, whatever that is, it lets us refer to that in a uniform way. Here's an example of some features that I think would be fun if we had in smart contract language. Um, we know that this address can either be the hash of a smart contract or a public key. Well, if we wanted to support linking external accounts, we could consider also supporting uh, other protocols, such as the names of other blockchains, other than the one we're writing a smart contract for, or even external accounts that have nothing directly to do with DeFi, like Twitter in this case. And I, I don't think that this syntax exists in any smart contract language as such. There are some libraries that facilitate um, these kind of processes of making use of linking from external accounts. Um, but the point is that this is a, a you know an example of some value that you might have by adding additional support for different kinds of identifiers into the smart contract language framework. So I'll wrap up this discussion on identifiers um, in this way. So as DeFi developers, you could expect to have to manage um, between the evolving context in which your accounts, tokens, and smart contracts run. Uh, you might expect to have to switch between implicit context when you want short names and explicit context when there is contention. There's other projects with potentially overlapping names that you need to uh, separate yourself from. And a general way of doing that is by adding some extra explicit context information into the identifiers that you're using when needed. Now, in DeFi, we have an expectation of making use of cryptography, and that's that's great. It gives us a leg up uh, compared to people only doing web development or uh, uh, just document identifiers, uh, where we could expect to basically make use of identifiers that have cryptographic components in them. Adding cryptography into an identifier makes it longer, which is you know bad for users being able to remember it or, or say it to each other. Um, but doing this adds a bunch of support for built-in access control. So if you include the hash of a document and an identifier, then you can check when you fetch the corresponding document that you got the right one. And by including either a public key or a program in an identifier, you can, in a self-describing way, indicate the access control policy uh, corresponding to the account that's identified by that name. And then the, the final note is to suggest that what you might try to do is to design names that are likely to succeed into the future. And really what this means is that you either have to anticipate what kinds of colliding names are likely to occur because of other projects competing with you in the DeFi ecosystem, uh, or if you can anticipate some standards that other projects will follow that can give you some guidance in how to, you can define names that will still be useful even when it's coexisting with other projects in the future.